Hey there, BookTube. Noah. Everyone who reads and must converse as a channel, thanks for coming by to uh, take part in Chapter 4 of Portrait of the Earth as a Young Man by James Joyce. Bloomsday. Bloomsday 2020. We, uh, we knocked it out. So, um, Lucas at Bits of Lit, description has a link. He's done um, Chapter 3. And I'm, I'm doing chapter four right now. So I'll touch on chapter three a little bit. You know, what a, what a, what a wild chapter, chapter three is. And, you know, I kind of thought when I read it that, you know, this is, this seems like, you know, you're reading the Inferno at some point, you know, it's just descriptions of hell. And just so you know, um, I'm also going through the Joyce Annotated by Don Gifford here to, um, to explore the text a bit, and I was thinking, you know, this is like, this is like, um, descriptions of hell, for sure, and, but, you know, not in a first-person narrative kind of thing, as, like, uh, Dante's Inferno is, but more like an indoctrination, and I said, so, you know, this retreat that Stephen is on is obviously very formative for his mind state, and who he is as a person and this is how they do it you know just to uh to give someone a healthy fear of hell you know a healthy fear of sin and and uh embracing sin you know embracing something that is going to ultimately eat you eat you up from the inside out so um we were talking it out and una kind of suggested on the voxer there um something about the, the Dante's divine comedy or something and it made me think a little more because chapter 5 is such this epiphany right maybe he even said something about the epiphany in in chapter 5 or something and I, and I just got to thinking and I had not gone through these annotations yet but chapter 3 as as inferno chapter 4 as purgatory and chapter 5 as paradise of of Dante's divine comedy. Now, if you if y'all for those of y'all that are familiar with James Joyce, I think you'll agree that Joyce likes to use things like that, you know, using the Odyssey in Ulysses for example, or uh different myths like that and using them but using them very loosely. I mean, he's he retains all of his creativity with it and can and just basically uses it as a scaffolding if that and 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 plays with different things might turn things on their head or might um you know subjugate certain things or something like that but it's there so the more that I that I've looked into it uh the more I'm totally convinced that 3 is like inferno 4 which we're getting into today is purgatory and 5 is like paradise so um, it calls into question, well, what is one and two then? And just to, just to kind of put my initial thoughts out there, I haven't done a lot of research into this at all. Haven't dug in at all. This is just my first kind of, uh, thoughts on it is that, you know, at the beginning of Dante's Inferno, he's running through the woods and he, and he comes upon these three beasts that are, uh, that are kind of chasing him, giving him chase through the woods and chase him to the gates of hell. And I kind of looked at it like, well, what if these three beasts are analogous? And in 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 Dante in in a uh, in Portrait of the Earth as a Young Man, as um, education, religion, and politics, these three um, systems of you know identity defining uh, an, an an individual based on. Uh, you know, a, a societal structure, a societal system. What if those are the beasts that drive Stephen to chapter three, you know? And chapter two, uh, you can see my video on it. It definitely seems like uh, wandering through a dark wood, you know, in a way, right? You know, it's just these portraits of like, you know, trying to, you're, you're trying to see uh, uh, the whole wood, and, and by examining individual trees kind of thing. So, 
Um, chapter chapter four starts off very uh, very quickly with Stephen in a very pious frame of mind. He's he's um, you know very involved with the church. He has at the end of chapter three. I hope you you know watched you know Steve or uh, Lucas's video. At the end of chapter three, he makes confession finally. You know, in chapter three, Stephen is very much in hell. He is racked with um, his, you know, sin always of uh, going out and 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 uh, meeting up with prostitutes, and this that's just like kind of his sin. His thing is lust like that, and um, in his daily life, he's living a holy life, living um, and and working um, in a Jesuit. Um, you know, structure in a, in the Jesuit church and, 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 you know, outwardly very upright and pious. So there's a lot of that cognitive dissonance going on with him. He knows, you know, what he's doing, of course, and he's a very self-reflective introverted guy anyways. So he's having a lot of trouble reconciling that. He knows what he needs to do, that he needs to confess and really just release himself from the this this kind of thing that is just working to contract his soul and contract his spirit inside and he knows that if he doesn't do it um he's going to be uh just locked up so he does that at the end of chapter 3 and then in chapter 4 it it goes through, it gives you you know a couple few pages of this kind of stuff every morning he hallowed himself anew in the presence of some holy image or mystery his day began with a heroic offering of its every moment of thought or action for the intentions of the sovereign pontiff with an early mass. His daily life was laid out in devotional areas by means of ejaculations and prayers. He stored up ungrudgingly for the souls in purgatory centuries of days and quarantines and years. Yet the spiritual triumph which he felt in achieving with ease so many fabulous ages of canonical pre pre penances did not go wholly reward did not wholly reward his zeal of prayer since he could never know how much temporal punishment he had remitted by the way of suffrage for the agonizing souls and fearful lest in the midst of his purgatorial life which differed from the infernal only in that it was not everlasting his penance might avail no one than a no more than a drop of moisture he drove his soul daily through an increasing work uh, increasing circle of works of supererogation um so he's he's saying right there uh it's it's Joyce is doing a, a, a cool thing with that because the prayers and and sacrifice self sacrifice that somebody would be doing on the daily like that in in a in a, a Jesuit uh, Catholic uh, belief system would be actually um, interceding, you know they would they would frame it in the way of interceding for the souls in purgatory because their suffering in purgatory is is a finite suffering. They are being made more and more pure. Um, to to eventually rise to heaven, right? So the 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 work that souls would do here on the on the on the material level would be working to intercede for them and to you know work kind kind of uh, pay some of that for them, you know, and so and he describes himself in that same sentence as in a uh, in the midst of purgatorial fire. So he is, you know, it, the claim is right there on the surface of it that he is in, in a, a type of purgatory. And what does his purgatory consist of? Um, it is um, a, 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 a devotion to a religious order and devotion towards the spiritual life. But an ache or a desire in the heart that um, calls him to something different, which is um, to be purely creative, to be a creative 
an unbounded creative. And he knows that in, um, in a uh, pious, you know, priest, like if he goes into the priesthood, um, that, that's not part of the deal. He's not going to be a free creative the way that he would be otherwise. So, um, to illustrate that, he says, But he could no longer disbelieve the reality of love, since God himself had loved his individual soul with divine love for all eternity. Gradually, as his soul was enriched with spiritual knowledge, he saw the whole world forming one vast symmetrical expression of God's power and love. Life became a divine gift for every moment and sensation of which were it even the sight of a single leaf hanging on the twig of a tree, his soul should praise and thank the giver. The world for all its solid substance and complexity no longer existed for his soul save as a, mo as a theorem of divine power and love and universality. So he has, um, he has gotten to a point of, of a spiritual framing of his life and a spiritual framing of the world uh, itself and you know he he gets to that kind of place and he kind of stays there to illustrate he had been forewarned of the dangers of spiritual exaltation and did not allow himself to desist from even the least or lowliest devotion striving only by constant mortification to undo the sinful past rather than to achieve a saintliness fraught, fraught with peril. Each of his senses brought under religious discipline. In order to mortify the sense of sight, he made his rule to walk in the street with downcast eyes, glancing neither to the right nor the left nor behind him. His eyes shunned every encounter with the eyes of women. From time to time he also bought them by sudden effort of will, as if by lifting them, lifting them suddenly in the middle of an unfinished sentence and closing the book. So he's, uh, you know, he's practicing hard, you know, really. And practicing what? Self-discipline. Practicing self-control. Practicing um, that, that spiritual disciplines that, you know, uh, are, are necessary at the beginning uh, especially at the beginning of a spiritual life, um, where where they're not something that is um, that you might even really realize the full reason for as a young as a young man. And and with this, I mean, you know, Stephen's still in this seventeen, I would say, maybe seventeen, maybe eighteen. Not 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 clear. It's not spelled out. So. Um, I, that's just my my guess there. So he's in a place that is very much uh, you know purgatorial. He's just uh, he doesn't want to become enwrapped and become enraptured in the spiritual life. There's a lot of warning against that, especially at, for a young practitioner. Um, so he's 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 staying in the ritual. He's staying. Uh, very much in the day-to-day -day practices that are are there to um to just kind of structure his life but you know you get a sense that well it's pretty boring and for Stephen that is not you know what his his uh what he's looking for going forward in his life and he gives voice to that so um this is when he's approached um in chapter 4, he's approached by a priest that, you know, acknowledges that he is a very uh, disciplined young man. And he has definitely gone through a lot of growth in his life. This priest might have uh, an inkling or might be even the priest that he confessed to, as far as, you know, I, I could tell, um, his sin. And... And so the priest offers him um, to enter the priesthood explicitly. Says, you know, there's a place for you. I think you would be good at it. I think you're 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 just the way. Um, you're just the uh, the type of young man 
one out of, you know, one out of a hundred, one out of 200 that, 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 uh, come through and then, um, actually take up a, a, a vocation in the, uh, church. Stephen listened in reverent silence now to the priest's appeal, and through the words he heard, even more distinctly a voice bidding him to approach, offering him secret knowledge and secret power. He knew he would know what, what it was, the sin of Simon Magus, and what the sin against the Holy Ghost, for which there was no forgiveness. He would know obscure things hidden from others, from those who were conceived and born children of wrath. He would know the sins, the sinful longings, the sinful thoughts, and the sinful acts of others, hearing them murmured into his ears in the confessional under the shame of a darkened chapel by the lips of women and girls, but rendered immune mysteriously at his ordination by the interposition of hands, his soul would pass again uncontaminated to the white piece of the altar. No touch of sin would linger on his hands, with which he would elevate and break the host. No touch of sin would linger on his lips in prayer to make him eat and drink damnation to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. He would hold his secret knowledge and secret power, being as sinless as the innocent, and he would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in there is touched a lot of things, of course. You know, the the mystery um, that he refers to, I'll, I'll, he'll know mysteries. He, he wants to gain this secret knowledge. There, there is a something in him, a drive to do that. He would gain, you know, the mystery of the uh, sin against the Holy Ghost. That is when um, in, in, uh, in the scriptures, when somebody accuses, Jesus of casting out demons in the name of the devil it says you don't cast out the devil you cast out demons and they listen to you because you speak for the devil who runs the demons that's why they listen to you and, the, and you can cast them out and he says you know uh, the the blaspheming against the son of man can be forgiven you can you can blaspheme against you know Jesus in the body you know he, he was saying that you can blaspheme that and that be forgiven, but you blaspheme the Holy Spirit itself and you call the Holy Spirit the devil, which is the same mistake as calling the devil God. And that will not be forgiven. That cannot ever be forgiven because it, it, if it is a conviction, then, you know, what is there to, to forgive? You don't you would never understand or be able to accept anything like that. So. Um, that is a mystery in there, in the church. Well, what is the black to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? You know, I gave like a little explanation right there, but you know, as you can see, theologically, you could poke all kinds of holes in that. And, 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 and what was meant by that is not very clear, but it, it just is said that there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. So, you know, um, what is, what is that? You know, I gave my, my own, my own thoughts on it for real. So, um, and then no touch of sin would linger on his lips in prayer to make him eat and drink damnation of himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. That is, um, taking communion in with an impure, uh, heart and an impure soul. Now, you know, everybody sins and everybody, you know, should take communion, that kind of thing. So, so what does that mean? Well, you know, the the lay person goes and confesses and then makes penance and repents for sin before taking communion. And if and if that confession is not made and that and you're not and you don't really release that, you know, se that that sin, that that kind of thing that is in you that that it, that it, you're hiding, that you're keeping you know, hidden even from yourself a lot of times, those those kind of um, sins that are unspeakable kind of stuff, like Stevens, for example, was unspeakable to him for, for a long, long, long time. To take communion with that kind of thing going on in your life is is uh, what he's referring to there. 
um, drinking and eating damnation to yourself. That is a sin on top of sin to take communion in that way. That's what that's what he's referring to. So um, now he's reflecting on the the uh, you know and 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 then for the rest of the chapter, really, he reflects on um, the decision. Can he be a priest? Should he go into the priesthood? What would that life kind of be like? And it's it's awesome, you know, the kind of things that are said. But um, to illustrate, I wanted to uh, just point on point at this, and then we'll get to the end. The voice of the director urging upon him the proud claims of the church and the mystery and the power of the priestly office repeated itself idly in his memory. His soul was not there to hear and greet it, and he knew now that the exhortation he had listened to had already fallen into an idle, formal tale. He would never swing the, th the thurible before the tabernacle as priest. His destiny was to be elusive of social or religious orders. The wisdom of the priest's appeal did not touch him to the quick. He was destined to learn his own wisdom, apart from others, or to learn the wisdom of others, himself wandering among the snares of the world. The snares of the world were its ways of sin. He would fall. He had not yet fallen, but he would fall silently in an instant. Not to fall was too hard, too hard, and he felt the silent lapse of his soul, as it would be at some instant to come, falling, falling, but not yet fallen, still unfallen, but about to fall. So he sees then um, kind of his, uh, his destiny. And his destiny is not as priest. Not, not as um, a, 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 uh, a member, an, an active member in the church hierarchy. And with that, he rejects all political and religious system. He rejects that as something that um, dictates his destiny and his it has it has a play in his fate. And so that's just the kind of uh, place he gets to. And right after that, you know, we have um, a scene where he is walking and he's just walking and walking and walking. And um, he doesn't even know how far he's walked. He's just walking. And he comes upon... A, um, a beautiful woman that is bathing in, in a river, in a, a, a small river, but she's bathing in the river. And she's singing. And we have in this um, more allusions to Dante's um, divine comedy. So I just want to bring them out. And we're just right here at the end. So this is going to wrap up chapter four. He Heavenly God, Stephen soul cried out in an outburst of profane joy. He turned away from her suddenly and set off across the strand. His cheeks were aflame. His body was aglow. His lips were trembling. On and on and on and on he strode, far out over the sands, swinging wildly to the sea, crying to greet the advent of life that had cried to him. Her image had passed into his soul forever and no word had broken the holy silence of his ecstasy. Her eyes had called him, and his soul had leaped at the call, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. A wild angel had appeared to him, that angel of mortal youth and beauty, an envoy from the fair courts of life, to throw open before him an instant of ecstasy, the gates of all the ways of error and glory, on and on and on and on. Um, the angel of mortal youth and beauty is an allusion to Beatrice. So Beatrice shows up at the end of purgatory um, and takes over as guide for Dante. Beatrice is the um, ideal beauty for Dante. And so this girl... That, that just happens to be bathing, um, gives Stephen that, that, that experience that we just read there and is an allusion to the end of purgatory there. 
He halted suddenly and heard his, heard his heart in the silence. How far had he walked? What hour was it? There was no human figure near him, nor any sound borne to him over the air. But this tide was near the turn, and already the day was on the wane. He turned landward and ran towards the shore, and running up the sloping beach, reckless of the sharp shingle, found a shabby nook amid the ring of tufted sand knolls, and laid down there, that the peace and silence of the evening might still be, still the riot of his blood. He felt above him the vast indifferent dome and the calm processes of heavenly bodies, processes of heavenly bodies, and the earth beneath him, the earth that had borne him, had taken him into her breast. So heaven above and earth below. Um, and he is right in the middle, you know. He closed his eyes in the languor of sleep. His eyelids trembled as if the, they felt the vast cyclic movement of the earth and her watchers, trembled as if they felt the strange light of some new world. His soul was swooning into some new world, fantastic, dim, uncertain as undersea, traversed by cloudy shapes and beings, a world, a glimmer, or a flower, glimmering and trembling, trembling and unfolding, a breaking light, an opening flower. It spread in endless succession to itself, breaking in full crimson and unfolding and fading to palest rose, leaf by leaf and wave of light by wave of light, flooding all the heavens with its soft flushes, every flush deeper than the other. And so, in that penultimate uh, paragraph to the end of uh, chapter four, we have um, a, uh, allusions to the final canto in Purgatory. So, um, very awesome to kind of find that, pull that out, and to see how uh, Joyce is modeling this. Steve, Stephen's story now is coming to um, a pretty big, uh, giant climax in chapter five. We get to see um, really where where his mind is at, and him as um, a, 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 a more mature um, man. Uh, still a young man, you know, what, 20, or 20 maybe in chapter 5? Not even, maybe, maybe 18, 19. So me and Lucas are going to do a chapter, uh, a chapter 5 video. We're going to each do one. So we'll have chapter 5 up uh, soon. Uh, check the, uh, check the, uh, the video on our, uh, our timeline just to, just to see when that is but I'll put it in the description box as well. So hope y'all are enjoying this book too. Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's on. And uh, have a good evening. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.